Welcome back for our second talk this morning. We have Bruce Sarazola who will tell us about a category of elements for enriched clusters. Right, uh, Bruce, so uh, we're going to be talking about enriched clusters and how they're used in our organization. Tell you about this work today. Uh, so this is um, work in preparation together with my authors, Dan Moser and Bhagavad Ragul. And it's about defining a category of elements construction for enriched functors. So, so the whole point of this project is to look at this classical construction and translate it to an enriched setting. I thought that I would spend some time today just recalling what the classical version is and what are the good features that it has that we want to maybe hope to recover once we do this generalization. So, Let's start by saying, what is the category of elements? Uh, in the classical setting, so this, this is just for a category set of objects, I'm going to face a category C, and I'm going to say for a counter, from C of two set is the category of elements which is denoted by this integral thing for reasons that honestly escape my knowledge um, is the category whose objects consist of the pairs of an object C in the category C and an element x in the set f of c. So those are the objects and the morphisms between a pair c x and a pair c prime x prime. It's going to consist of a morphism in c from c to c prime. And now, if we apply our functor to this thing, since it's contravariant, it's going to flip the direction. Right? And we have this x prime down here. So we can wonder what happens when we apply this function now. So this is f, f of x prime. It's an element in the set. And the condition for this to be a morphism is that this element agrees with the x that we started with. So morphisms are x such that f, f of x prime is precisely x. All right. So we see that the category of elements takes a functor and spits out a category, and in fact it does this in a factorial manner. So this gives a functor from pre-sheaves to cat. And in fact, since these are pairs, so we can always take a projection onto the first coordinate. And we see that we recover the objects of C and the morphisms of C. So we recover all the data in C. So in fact, this isn't just a category. It's a category that comes with a projection to C. So it lives in this slice. All right. So the next thing that I should tell you, still talking about the classical case, is why do we care? How come this construction is so important in category theory? Um, so I'm going to highlight a few features of it. And the first thing I want to say is something relating to vibrations. So Christina was talking about growth and deep vibrations. I want to mention the discrete case. So if I have a functor, this is a discrete vibration. If I look at the following diagram, so I take the morphisms of P going down to the objects of P via the target, I can do the same thing with C. And I can complete this with my functor P by functoriality. This word always commutes. P is a discrete vibration precisely when this is a pullback. All right? So, it turns out, what's the relation between this and this? It turns out that this projection that we said that we always have from the category of elements to C 
is always a discrete vibration. And moreover, if we now take our cavity of Bellman's sculptor and we restrict it to the discrete vibrations, which are the things hit by the image, let me spit this as a theorem. If we restrict to discrete vibrations over C, it turns out that this is an equivalence of categories. is that the category of elements construction gives us a new perspective on free sheets because it allows us to think of a free sheet as a discrete vibration and vice versa, right? So that's the first feature that I want to mention. The second has to do with representability of free sheets. And there's this theorem, so I'm not giving authors for these theorems because I think that they're considered folk nowadays. Um, but the second is the theorem that a free sheet is representable if and only if we look at its category of elements and we find a terminal object. So this is pretty cool, right? We know that representable functors are one of the most important types of functors that there are. In particular, we define universal properties um, by the representability of a certain pre sheet. So what this result is telling us is that if we have a functor and we wonder if it has a limit or a co-limit or an adjoint or something like this, we can boil down that question to whether a certain category of elements for the correct pre sheet has a terminal element. And the last thing that I want to mention has to do with weighted limits. And it's the fact that, and I'm still in the categorical setting to be clear, weighted limits are just good old limits, by which I mean conical limits. All right, so conical limits is just whatever we really understand in category theory when we say limit, something living under a cone. And there's this notion that appears in enriched category theory of a weighted limit, and it doesn't really appear in category theory. And here's the reason why. It's because the notion of weighted limit is not a new thing. They can always be captured as a good old limit of a certain functor. Um, so this is a very cool result, and you may think, okay, there's no category of elements here, but it features as the main idea of the proof of this fact. So this relies on the fact that if I have a diagram whose limit I want to compute, so this is my diagram, let's say that I have a weight, and I want to compute the weighted limit of this, then it turns out that this is precisely the same as computing the conical, so just the regular limit, of a slightly different functor. So now my indexing category will be the category of elements of the weight. As we said, we can always project down to i, and now we can compose with my original diagram. So this is how we have this passage. All right, so this is all the classical story. Now I'm going to start moving on to the enriched part of the story. So our goal is to replace every instance of the category set in this story with a category V. Um, and I do need to make some concessions here about V. Maybe I'll write them. Uh, where should I write them? Let's do it right here. So here V, I'm assuming it's going to be Cartesian closed. Um, it has pullbacks. And I'm assuming it's also extensive. 
which I won't define precisely for you, but really uh, what it means is that it has co-products, and those co-products inter interact nicely with the pullbacks that it has. Um, and the reason I care about all of these technical things, so let me maybe mention what's going to be used about these things. So these give me two very useful consequences. The first one is that V is V enriched because we have an internal hum. And the second one is the fact that I get an embedding of sets into V because now I can take a set and look at it as as many copies of the terminal object, which is the monoidal unit here. All right, so my goal is to capture the grid setting, so I'm gonna replace every instance of set by a V, and so what this means is that I'll also be replacing every instance of categories, which as you know are set enriched categories. These are going to be replaced by V categories. And every instance of clusters, like I had over there, from C up to set, are going to be replaced by V functors from a V category C up into V. Alright? So, with these replacements, now my question is, alright, given a C op, which is a V enriched category, I want to define some manner of category of elements <coughs> which takes as inputs all of the V enriched functors from C up to V, right? This is really the translation of the domain of the category of elements that we find here. So, of course, I could do the exact same thing uh, in a way, but that's really not what I'm going for. Now I have an enriched functor, I should be capturing all of the enrichedness that's going on here. It needs to, like, properly capture all of the data. So the first question that appears is, what should live in here? What is the type of structure that's going to manage to capture all of this accordingly? So let's try to get some intuition by looking at the classical case over here. Um, now we said set is replaced by V. And we said, all right, we know that caps is the same as set enriched categories. So if we look at what's going on here, we may think that the natural codomain for a category of elements of enriched functors is simply V categories. That seems to be the obvious first thing to try. However, it turns out that this doesn't really work. Um, and to illustrate why, let me do some rewriting of this data that I gave you right here. So I could alternatively define the category of elements as the category whose set of objects consists of the co-products over the C's and C of all the sets FC. And you can take a look at how this co-product is encoding the same data as all of these possible pairs, right? This gives us the index, this gives us the element in the specific FC. And I could encode all the morphisms by looking at the maps in C from C to C prime times F of C prime, which is encoding this X prime right here. And there's no appearance of F of C because we said if we know the F and we know the X prime, then the X is uniquely determined. That's why there's no F of C in this equation. So this is a nifty way to write down the same pieces of data. And if I was being really neat, I should give you like an identity and a source and a target, which I am definitely not going to do today and kind of guess what these are. 
Um, but this is what I'm going to try to generalize, because now I'm not talking about the elements belonging anywhere. This is nicely abstract. Let's look at this and see what happens in the case when f is not a functor going to set, but rather a functor going to v. So now we have this morphism, this object of morphism, c from c to c, but c is an, a v enriched category, so this thing is an object in v. And now each f of c and f of c prime is also an object of v. So both of these creatures are objects in v. And we can see how that doesn't fit the formalism of v enriched categories. In a v enriched category, <coughs> I have a v object of morphisms, which will be fine but I should have only a set's worth of objects. And instead here, I have a V object's worth of, morph of, of objects. So what this really fits into is the setting of internal categories to V, which have appeared uh, extensively in quite a few of the talks already this week. So these give us a V object of objects and a V object of morphisms. So that's what's going to encode all the data nicely. And what I do need to be careful about is what happens with my slice. Before I was doing cat over c, I can't do cat v over c because those are two diff different things. c is not internal, it's enriched. But I can remember that there's an internalization functor that takes a v category into an internal category by just putting a discrete object of objects. So to give you an idea of what this internalization does, if we think of v equals cat, then cat categories are two categories. Categories uh, internal to cat are double categories. And what this internalization does is it takes a two category and it looks at it as a double category with only identities as the vertical data. All right, so that's what's going on here. And I can now look at the slice over the internalization of my fixed in average category All right, so this uh, alternative presentation is maybe the most pedagogical way to explain to you why we really need internal categories to come into this game. Uh, but actually, this fact is also supported by previous study of v equals cat. So, just in the case of v equals cat, um, Grandis and Perre already have a category of elements construction, which takes a two functor and spits out a double category. So, we're really seeing the um, the same fact that we see over there. In fact, they study what happens in case three. Now, in the case of two categories, weighted limits are not a trivial notion anymore. They really are something new. They are very well known to not be two limits. These are not the same. But they prove that weighted limits in two categories are just conical double limits by using this double category of elements. And later, uh, Klingman and Moser use the same double categorical construction to look at property 2, and they show that a 2 functor, which would now go to v, uh, sorry, to cat, is representable precisely if the double category of elements has a double terminal object. So this story already existed for the case of cat, and it all worked really nicely. And of course, what we're doing here, which is defining it in precisely this same abstract way, coincides with what Grandis and Prey are doing, and it also coincides with the classical one. Because, so here, we, I said we were going to set cat. The reason why there's no clash with what we are doing is because for the very special case of equal sets, categories enriched in sets are the same as categories internal to sets are the same as just categories. So this is a, a nice, a nice feature that was totally hidden in this classical case. All right, so now the question is, uh, how many of these features still hold in our uh, enriched construction? 
So to talk about these features, it requires a little bit of a translation. Um, so here we were talking about discrete vibrations in categories. There's a notion of discrete vibrations in internal categories as well, basically by translating this picture. So if I have a font there, between these internal categories, then I can always consider what the morphisms of this P are. These are now encoded in an object in V of morphisms. The objects are now encoded in another object in V, and I still have a target, and I can do the same thing for this other internal category. And I have our functor. So again, this always commute. And we can say that P is a discrete vibration when this is a pullback in V. All of these things are living in V. So there's a natural notion of discrete vibration. It's also true that now, if we consider our enriched, um, our enriched construction, then this is an internal category going to its seat. This is also always a discrete vibration. And in fact, we can prove that um, that our version is also an equivalence of categories. So the same interplay with discrete vibrations uh, appears here. For the second one, we were talking about representability. Now we would have a V functor from C up to V being V representable, if and only if this internal category has a terminal object. And again, this is a notion that can be quite easily translated. So um, if we construct the following diagram, so I'm going to say T is terminal in an internal category A. If we look at the following diagram, so I'm going to go from A to A cross A by first doing identity and then doing constant at T, I can consider the internal category of uh, internal functors from this horizontal arrow and do source and target. And I can take the pullback of this thing, which I'm going to denote as the slice of A by T. And T is terminal precisely when this comparison map is an isomorphism. This recovers what we know and love as a terminal object. Um, so if we look at internal terminal objects, this correspondence also holds for a category of elements. And finally, what happens with weighted limits is also a mirror of the previous case. So we get that weighted limits of an enriched functor are just conical internal limits. And what's really nice about this result is that it uses the exact same idea. So even like the proof, the basic proof strategy still works. I will now have my weight going to B, and I would say that the weighted limit of this diagram is the internal limit, um, where now, of course, I need to consider the internalized version of the last bit. But this still holds. However, as much as the general idea holds, I believe that this isomorphism in the classical case is like a two-line proof or something like this. Um, this case is, is much, much more evolved. Um, all right, so um, this is all that I wanted to tell you. Maybe I'll finish with an invitation, which is that I'm sure that all of you have encountered the category of elements very often. Um, these are some of the features that we consider most important, but if you want to come up and tell me some other features that you think should be reflected, I'll be very happy to hear about those. All right, thank you very much.
uh, new feature, I, I hope, uh, which will be uh, another feature which, which is also very important for the for the road reconstruction, is that it, uh, it is one part of a, of a factorization system, comprehensive factorization. You see, but this is this also important. Um, okay, that's a great question. Um, so I think that's a great question. Um, let me see if, if I'm understanding correctly. So you're, the factorization system that you're talking about is like the co-final functors and, right. Um, yeah, we, we haven't really thought of what that would mean in the average setting. Um, but you see, the idea of construction is very easy. Mm -hmm. You have a functor, and you take the terminal object of the domain, its image, and, and there you take the free shift, uh, uh, you take the element construction. So uh, it should be fixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the very clear talk. Um, could I ask whether we are able to capture cross deck vibrations and street vibrations within this context as a sample of discrete vibrations? Um, that's another good question. And uh, let's see. So if we wanted to do growth and deep vibrations instead of discrete vibrations, that's the version that will go to CAT. Right? Um, so for us, that's the version that will go. Um, so what should that do? That should go to VCAT in a way. But then that gets a little bit tricky because VCAT is often not V enriched. So I'm not sure how often it will make sense to consider V enriched functors from C to VCAT. Well, that's, that's why I, I'm asking that maybe the, the, the generalized discrete vibrations that may be happening in the box. You mean just try to translate the notion without having a functor like so? Maybe we can try functors. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Perhaps. Um, but without having thought about this much, I wouldn't expect it to form part of a, as nice a picture as this just because of these enrichment obstructions. Uh, let's take another in the back. Yeah. Yeah, so there is also a working construction for two categories, two functors, right? Then it's in two categories and not double categories. So what's the link with the with your construction? Okay, that's, that's an excellent question, right? Because I'm, I'm trying to have you all believe that you should immediately go to internal categories, but for the case equals cat, Leo's absolutely right. There does exist a two categories of elements, um, but what happens is that it doesn't recover these nice features. Um, so I believe that this is also in uh, Lin and Slil's paper, that they show that if you just consider the two categorical version of this category of elements, then terminal objects there do not encode the representability of the functor. So it exists, but it's not serving the purpose fully. Great, let's take one more right here. So do you have uh, any set about spare defense? Like, uh, so uh, some ideas that you tried to generalize in this setting, but didn't really work out. Not really, no. Um, we so the the classical growth and deconstruction also has two adjoints. We believe that this one has two adjoints as well. That's why I was like trying to crowdsource maybe um, some other features that we haven't thought of, but but no, not as not as yet. Okay, that's nice. Thanks. All right, let's thank her again.